Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to day two of the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. Uh, my name is Carl Fudge. I'm a first year here at, M uh, at MIT Sloan. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to Big Data Lessons from Sports, uh, presented by HP Vertica. Got a great group of panelists with, the, with us here today. Uh, Chris Sellen from HP Vertica. Jeff Hammerbacker from Cloudera. Claudia Polish from M6D. And Joe Doyle from the MIT Sloan School. Our panel will be, will be moderated today by Michael Schrag, also of MIT Sloan. We have an hour. The panel will, will go until 11.20, and we'll leave, as usual, 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please do so by tweeting uh, with the hashtags SSAC13 and 210 uh, with your question. Uh, with that in mind, I'll hand over to you now, uh, Michael. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. We have a terrific group of people. Let me try to set it up this way. Big data ranks pretty high on the hype meter. And one of the flaws of this panel is that we're all pretty bloody good on the big data and analytics side, but we don't really have a sports person here. So we're counting on the audience to be the reality check for some of the issues that we're going to discuss. My question and concern is, besides the hype aspect, is is big data really nothing more than money ball on steroids, pun intended, or money ball with petabytes? Is there something qualitatively as well as quantitatively different about how what big data can do can transform analytics and insight in sports management along every dimension, from coaching to fans, loyalty, the whole nine yards? The conversation here, I would like to be fairly high energy. Uh, there's going to be a lot of interruptions, I hope. If not, I will be the one doing the interrupting. Um, and I just want to begin, because everybody, because big data is a big buzz phrase, I want to begin with Jeff, whose company is really both a pioneer and a leader in defining the infrastructure and opportunities here. What, in your experience, do people fundamentally misunderstand about big data and how to get value from their investments and organization to take advantage of that investment in big data? Uh, sure. So I think um, one of the biggest misunderstandings is that big data is best used by physicists instead of social scientists. So there's kind of one uh, paradigm of doing science, uh, which physics uh, represents, which is much more about uh, complex modeling. Uh, and there's another paradigm uh, that social science sort of represents, which is much more about uh, attempting to understand uh, you know, difficult to operationalize um, constructs, uh, which you're using for both outcome measures and for the entities uh, and the attributes of those entities that you might be measuring. So most of the people that I talk to who are attempting to use big data to improve their business are generally uh, working with uh, human beings as the entities <laughs> that they care most about. And it turns out that a lot of the techniques that have been evolved over the past uh, 20 to 30 years uh, for studying human beings are a lot more useful than the techniques that have been evolved uh, for studying uh, you know, the fundamental particles of the universe. Uh, so I think you know, I, were, I started my career on Wall Street, and there was this urge to import physicists en masse uh, on Wall Street. And a lot of the tools and techniques that they brought to bear in the problems, I think, ultimately proved less. A trillion dollars later, yes. Yeah, we, we learned a very expensive lesson, that those tools and techniques were probably going to be less useful for um, generating real business value than the tools and techniques that have evolved uh, in the social sciences. And, and here in Cambridge, there's a really great, uh, so Gary King runs uh, the Institute for Quantitative Social Sciences uh, at Harvard. And I, I pay much closer attention to the research that's being done there than I do you know, at, from the research that's coming out of like you know, Slack or something like that. Or, or MIT, you passive aggressive bastard. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hey, I'm a Harvard grad. So. <clears throat> no, no, nobody's perfect. Jeff. Yeah. There you go. Claudia. Well, one thing is that everybody seems to be very impressed with size, and I don't really share that attitude. Um, I've been in this business when big data wasn't big yet and was big enough to do a lot of useful things with it. So at the end of the day, it's not the petabytes that you're collecting right now. Uh, it still comes down to finding the parts that actually matter and are useful. I'm all for collecting a lot. But uh, what brings to bear to make a real difference is typically a lot less. You just don't know ex ante what it is. And I think that's a piece of understanding that we have to push further. I don't want to start thinking very much. I have to measure this indicator on that one. 
just measure it all and then use more of the algorithmic tools. Kill them all and let God sort it have out. Have the data speak to you through the kind of the methods of the analytics instead of trying to ex to figure out what it is you want to look at. So my inference from what you're saying is you believe that people should by folk begin with big data by collecting everything. Measure and collect everything. So I guess my tenor is it's not big data, it's raw data. I'm a data scientist, I love raw data. Not fizzled with, nobody else had access to it, nobody has replaced missing values yet, it's just the way you collected it on the very detailed event level, that's the way I love my data. Very good, so the, the title of this panel should be Big Raw Data. <laughs> Joseph. Okay, well, I'm an economist, so I'm a social scientist who tries to use uh, data to answer questions, and so the question was, what's the biggest misunderstanding? Well, um, you know, the, the cost, I, as an economist, I think about costs and benefits. So the cost of computing has come down so much that now that we have so much data around what are we going to do with it, and from the social science standpoint, it is this correlation versus causation difference that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Um, one of the concerns with what we do with all this big data are, if we're looking for pattern recognition, um, when do we need to just have correlations to be able to inform our decisions, and when do we need to have a causal statement to inform our decisions? And as an economist, I'm always on the causal side, but I also see the benefit of the correlation side. Yeah, but what do people not understand? What don't they understand? Well, when I read you know, the popular press, or the, not popular press, but the, uh, the type of publications that we all read, let's put it that way, um, <laughs> there's this, some of the success stories are really big data that's been filtered down into useful bits. And so, um, yeah, how do you take the raw data down to useful bits? That's what I like to think about. Um, versus just letting the algorithms tell us what the answer is. My concern is if we just go with the algorithm side, that um, it could lead you down the wrong path. This is the trillion dollar um, wrong path type of problem. That, that's where I worry a little bit about the misunderstanding that just the data is going to solve all our problems. There's this saying that we need big judgment um, merged with big data, and I think that that's absolutely right. Chris. Well, you know, what I, what I tell people all the time is the good, thing, it, the good thing about the term big data is it's really gotten latched onto popularly. As you said, there's a lot of hype around the term. And it gives people on both, you know, the answer to your question earlier, is it about petabytes or is it about, I think you said, money ball and steroids, is it's both. And it depends whether you're talking to a technologist that's, or that's a business That's the diplomatic person. answer, it's both. It's it depends, both. It depends on who you're selling it to. It depends who you're talking to or okay. who you're selling to. So, okay. But you know, it's interesting because in the technology circles, as those of you can look it up on Wikipedia and a lot of you probably already know, big data is not a new term to technologists. You know, it's been talked about for at least a dozen years now. And so in the technology community, this whole idea that data volumes were going to grow dramatically, and not just grow, but grow very fast and very wide varieties of data, all these Vs, many of you have probably heard the three Vs model of big data, you know, volume, velocity, variety, and then value. What's really happened, you know, my colleague Jason Bailey was telling me the other day, he's like, don't wear a suit to this conference because, <laughs> you know, nobody likes suits. Well, there are a lot of suits now. And over the last two years, that's what's really happened is that this idea like, how do we extract value from this, whether it's you know, keeping our players on the field longer or making more money in ticket sales or what have you. So this stuff has all started to, started to come together. But to get back to your original question, it's not just big data, it's growing very fast. What do the client, you're, you're, you're yeah. in sales, so in a, in a, in a, in a not more well, than just sales, sort of. my yeah. apologies. We're all in sales. We're all in sales, so. touche. Yeah. But, but when you actually sell, what do people not get? What do people, what do, what do they, they just don't get? Do they think, you know what? 20% of my most difficult problems go away if I gather another 10 gigs. Mm -hmm. Or do they think, crap, I'm going to have to rent more time on Amazon Web Services, or crap, even worse, I'm going to have to hire a data scientist, and I don't even understand the statisticians and actuaries we already employ. Uh, I, I what, think I would what, say people don't get that we're just at the very beginning of this. Mm -hmm. And it's just starting to take off, and it's going to ramp very, 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 very fast. So it's not just size. It's so speed. in other words, we're hyped but not hyped enough because we're just at the beginning. It's going to change everything. It's going to really change everything because, you know, one choice is we can ignore it. And I was actually going through as I was kind of prepping up the, the number of teams that are actually using services like stats and the number that aren't. And still most aren't. Right. And at some point, is it going to be an option not to do it? And that's, it, it's an option. Now, what it means to your business or your team or what have you, we'll see. So. We talked about what your customers don't understand. What's the most important thing you want people to understand about the work you're doing in big data? 
the unique insights that your work brings to this theme, particularly in the context of sports. Joe. Uh, so frankly, the, uh, the ability to measure anything is, the ability to improve anything depends on whether you can measure it. So big data is allowing us to measure new things for the input side of whatever system you're interested in and on the output side. So what I, I study healthcare and what types of things save lives. So it's, um, you know, when I think about big data, I think of opportunities to start to say something causal about what helps people. So I just wanted to give one example. So I looked at very low birth weight newborns. They're three pounds, five ounces, really small newborns. And if, you're, if you weigh just below that 1,500 gram threshold, you get, we found you get 20% more care than if you weigh just above that threshold. So these newborns are really similarly healthy because, or unhealthy, they're just right around 1,500 grams, but one gets a lot more care than the other. Using huge data sets, we're able to find enough people around that threshold to say, okay, here's something that's, we get extra care, did it translate into extra lives saved? And we found there were huge returns to spending on these newborns. So we should treat 1,500 gram newborns, 1,501 gram newborns more than 1,499. So one of the big advantages I see of big data is be able to dig deep into um, these types of what I call natural, or what we know as natural experiments. Um, you should say who you studied under. Oh, yeah, so well, I'm a, I'm a mini free economist. Uh, my advisor at Chicago was Steve Levitt. And um, so now I'm teaching a class at Sloan about basically how to implement free economics in, uh, in business there. <laughs> Once again, the freshwater economists take over the, the, the seawater, saltwater economists. What's your answer? Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> there you go. The question is, what's the most important thing you want the people in this room to understand about your, what you do in big data? Um, the most important thing that I want people to understand about what I do. Uh, <laughs> that you named Hadoop. Uh, I did not name Hadoop. Uh, <laughs> I guess that the software we make is free and open source, so you can just go download it okay. and do your then, own work. Then I'll ask you the follow-up question. Yeah. You have a cap on your head. Sure. Do any, have any of the Bay Area sports teams said, given local, asked you, geez, what should we be doing in this area? Uh, yeah, we've actually, um, you know, we did an event with Billy Bean uh, about last month with our customers. Last month. Um, and I got to know their, uh, the director of baseball operations over there, uh, Farhan, uh, a little bit. Um, we did a, a co offsite, company offsite there two years ago. Uh, I got to meet him. Uh, the CIO for the Giants, we've uh, spent a little bit of time hanging out with uh, him. I didn't get to go to that event, but... Uh, do, do they, quote, get it? Or is it just nice because... Yeah, I mean, the, they, they definitely get it. I, I, you know, I actually, I learn a lot from how uh, sports analytics works. Uh, to take to our business. I think, I think there's actually, sports analytics is actually much more the future than, uh, than we are the future in that. Terrific. <laughs> and then I think a lot of the, the, like I said, so social sciences have more to teach us than physics. And I think a lot of the evolution of uh, metrics in sports over the past several years uh, has been fascinating to watch. So there's, you know, the movement from, uh, you know, batting average to on-base percentage right. to on-base slugging percentage, uh, all the way up to, to things like wins above replacement, have seen, um, uh, it's followed a path of uh, these are you know so you have these theoretical constructs that you want to isolate which is what is the value of this person to to my team and then you have different ways to operationalize those constructs and sports have really evolved the, along the path of operationalizing constructs such that the constructs become much more valid do you think it, they make big data more relevant or do you think they make sim that's simply a better filter to screen out the raw that, that yeah, I, I think Claudia is right. I've never been particularly enamored of data volume as like a predictor of <laughs> value, um, but I am enamored of um, being as close to the measurement device as possible. So the, the notion of raw data versus big data makes a lot of sense. You are directly in the What's the most important thing the audience needs to understand in that regard? So my <laughs> my particular specialty in that space, and there are a lot of things that data scientists are doing these days. Um, I always got interested in predictive modeling. Um, I'm actually very competitive at heart. Um, and the nice thing about predictive modeling is you can actually measure how well you're doing. So there are like even data side, data mining competitions if you're interested in those. Because you can always measure against that quantity that you're trying to learn a relationship about how well you're doing forecasting that. And that's the piece that appeals to me, which brings me to the metric. Um, I think people underestimate how good methods now can predict various different things. 
and being able to Give find me an example. Give us an example. Okay, so I work in appetizing, um, not for deep conviction of heart, but... Um, <laughs> you don't have to apologize. <laughs> Just give us an example. Um, it's a great playground to try out whatever you want in big data right now. So Excellent. that's what I love about that piece. And you can tell that this is an industry that is half gut, maybe 80%. And the other 20% is people having tried to optimize clicks for the last 10 years. And clicks are just terrible metric for absolutely anything. If you optimize clicks, I promise you, you won't sell anything. It's just not happening. We're really good at optimizing clicks. I mean, I can make a killing if that's what you really want. But we have to be careful whether we ultimately are still focusing on the right metrics or if we just kind of with some vague proxy that may or may not be related to it what because is the, the methods are so good. What is the correlation in your experience? And Chris's background is an OR, so I'm going right. to be very interested in his measure of effectiveness so, follow-up on this. Between the, the volume or the variety or another V of the raw data, mm -hmm. I want to draw this distinction between raw and big. Okay. How helpful is more raw data in giving you insight into the more appropriate metric to attack? So let me give you three kind of levels of data that I could work with. One is demographic information and other stuff like credit card and tender or mm -hmm. you know, soccer mom, whatever you want to call people. Mm -hmm. The second is what you actually do the actions you take, the URLs you visit, the stuff you watch, the things you buy. The third, who you are, your identifier, like your name, your, your address, like specific about right. you. Of the three things, the by far most relevant thing is what you do. I don't care what people proclaim you to be, and I don't want to know who you are. None of this matters to me. What matters to me is what you do, and that is kind of the raw layer, and with that, we see major improvements, and that's when these things like click just fall by the wayside, because you can prove that the models on that are so good that what you pick up with clicking is people with eyesight problems and big fingers on small devices. <laughs> this is fa fascinating. So, so my, again, my inference from this correlation causality, and Chris, I'd like your, your yep. is, is how you instrument is going to be key, because what you're saying is that it should be verbs, not nouns, that you, you yeah. get, get a better richness of rawness around. Mm -hmm. Is this consistent with your knowledge on this? Or, or is, is yeah, you know, the two or thing, a bigger relational database the, the way to go? The two things, no, well, you know, that's, that's a tool, right? Okay. right? And, you know, as I always say, a hammer's a tool, right? And in right. the hands of a good carpenter, a hammer can build a beautiful house. And in the hands of a bad carpenter, a hammer can make a really big mess. You know, um, somebody also said to me recently, or I think I read this quote, I, can't remember who's attributed to. If you torture data enough, you can get any answer you want. Yeah. And I think that is that is something we definitely need to be careful of. Is you know this requires skilled people and understanding. And you know there was a, I'm sorry, it was HBR. So sorry to you know, so it's slow, no, but there was something about hiring a great data scientist. And now some people just have this knack and this talent. So right. well, I was kidding, but um, I'm but, not. Uh, you know, it's good tools and good people. And but just. Getting you, at but, what's meaningful. But are your company, are, are companies coming to you? Are you going to organizations and yep. saying, you know, instead of how do we optimize click or optimize existing behavior strands? Do you say, my gosh, everybody has iPhones. There's, there's location. There's inertial mm -hmm. location. There's all manner of trackability. Heck, we can do retina. We can do eye, eye, eye tracking. Yep. Are people becoming more concerned about instrumentation? generating raw data for analysis and, and actions for analysis? Or are they saying, look, we have a crap load of data. Give us a better way to manage it, please. Faster, better, cheaper. Well, it's both, but the first one I'm is the I, say, both. <laughs> I can't say both anymore. Somebody yeah. throws something yeah. at me if I yeah. say both again. But the, the far more interesting question is the first one. Where they, and usually there's a problem and a hypothesis about it, but they have no way to prove it. So, and they really, there's so much data, they just can't manage it because just to look at it's overwhelming. You know, it's like the stat about stats. It would take a, um, I was talking to the stats guys earlier, it would take 100 full-time employees to manage all of this data that the right. cameras are now producing in the basketball game. So it's, it's an overwhelming amount of data. So there's a hypothesis, there's a problem trying to figure out. But as they, as they start digging into it, they find other things. And what's meaningful and what's not. And then also what variables can you extract 
that have meaning that you have to figure out a different way to get to. Because, you know, I've been hearing a lot already, and I wasn't here yesterday, but already this morning about psychographic factors. Right. You know, the, the sort of mental factor in some of these games and that some athletes have. The nice thing about sports analytics is the fact that at the end, somebody wins, somebody loses. And what variables drove that? And, you know, it might be how many steps, it might be how far a certain player ran, but it also might be what's in their let's, head. And how do I pull some of that stuff out? And that's where I think we're let's, going Let's with deal with, the, the, with what we've heard from Chris and, and Claudia, Joe, in, in the healthcare environment. Should, and we can map this to sports, of course, why not instrument? Here's the hypothesis to test. Let's instrument every doctor in the hospital, every nurse in the hospital, everybody who does patient touch in the hospital environment and see what kind of correlations and indeed possibly mechanisms there are in the healthcare outcomes. You did that with preemie babies. Let's do that with, let's, let's, those are actions. We, we instrument flow, interactions, communications. Would that be a big deal or a marginal deal? Is that the way healthcare should go? Instrument everything. Well, I absolutely think that would be a huge deal because we would be able to look inside, peel off the roof of a hospital and see where people are moving and where diseases are moving within the hospital, where um, any kind of um, factory, you'd want to be able to measure, you know, where are the defects and trace them back to their origins. So here, we defects here are people dying. So that seems like an important thing to try to figure out where uh, people are moving. Look, I, one of the big concerns I have with data, just starting with the data, is that I like to start with the question and then see what we get with the data. Because if you start with the data, you can, your head could swim. But, so one question is, do we use specialists too much? Specialists are very expensive. And do we use too much of them to, um, a lot of people think that we do. Well, in the current claims data, all I can really say now is, on consecutive weekends, we see variation in the number of specialists around. Um, so you have a heart attack, you go in, and you're lucky enough to have a few specialists there. If you go in another weekend, that's next weekend, you're unlucky, and they only had one specialist there. Does that make a difference to save your life? But with this kind of data, you'd be able to actually see, on a, um, trace out who's interacting with whom, which GPs are interacting with which specialists, and be able to measure performance better. I think so that's got to be let's map that onto sports. You told yeah. me in the, in, in the green room that you're a, you're a Phillies fan. I didn't tell you that I was from, you know, Chicago, but that's another, another conversation on this. Would you advise the Phillies to instrument their players all the time for practice, et cetera? Do you think that would be, if they come to you and say, hey, you're a, you're a, you're a data expert, you're an, you, you just got tenure at MIT, there must be something <laughs> smart to you on this. Help us in, in this regard. What advice would you give in terms of natural experiments that go with a sports team or a sports franchise? How instrumentation oriented would you be? How data generation versus hypothesis test would you be in giving advice to a franchise, to a team? Well, my standpoint is so you have to start with the question and then see what this new opportunity called big data can, can get you. But, so if you track all the, all, the, all the athletes, for example, you could start to predict what causes injury. So you see where they are, when are they, are they where they're supposed to be when they're stretching? Are they meeting with the right coaches? Because you're going to have which coaches matter for which injuries. I think that would be a great way to uh, start to roll out this healthcare type of analytics to, to a baseball or... Uh, Jeff, what would you do? To a, my... A, a, a pro team says, you're not a moron, you yeah. dress like us, yeah. help us. <laughs> uh, I, I think that there's a lot of uh, people have kind of, they focus a lot on performance. Uh, so I'm not sure that there's a, a, as much uh, room left to improve on that side, so I'd probably focus a lot more on uh, how we generate revenue through <laughs> sales of merchandise, through getting fans in the stadium. That's, that's probably, if I ran a sports team today, that's where I'd apply my knowledge. So, uh, because I'm curious about this. Can you just show of hands how many people here work with, a, with teams, sports teams? <clears throat> Excellent. I'm going to ask for you to raise your hands. How many of you instrument your players all the bloody time? Not a single hand. You're wrong. You're wrong. OK. Because they're not. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, so why, why do you then believe that the, 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 they're focusing on performance? Jeff didn't say that he thinks they're over-instrumented. He said there's too much focus right now on tweezing out 
little bits of performance, and therefore there's more money to be made if instead you focus your effort on selling tickets. I, I hate it when you come to the defense of your fellow panelists <laughs> on, on, on this. Do, but do you think, do you think if, if you're running, if, if, if Bayern München comes in and, and says, should, they be, should players be instrumented? You're the one who, who, who introduced the importance of not the, not the category, not the individual, but the actual behavior. So I think it's important to capture people's actions and decisions. Whether this is literally every step I take, that I'm not sure what the incremental value of that information would be. Um, so on that one, I, if marginal cost of storing more is near zero, I don't see the harm in it. Right. Practices are being videotaped, which right. is a quasi form of instrumentation. But I also share uh, the, the thought that while I very much love data and start with data, <clears throat> at the end of the day, unless you find a decision that you want to be better at making, it doesn't matter what you do with your data. It all comes back to, is there something you could be smarter at choosing, whether it's who to put on the field or not to, what you're supposed to tell them in the break to get them really ramped up to do the best job out there. You have to think of what are the important decisions that affect things. And you need to collect the information around those decisions. But, what if, but, but if you don't know, like you just said, well, you don't we, know what the incremental value is, how do you No, make but decisions? I think somebody in the business knows what important decisions are. Why, Amy, I may not. Why do we use this phrase incremental value? I mean, I, I, I make no claim to be a, a sports analytics nut or buff. But I can say without hesitation that if people aren't being instrumented all the time, I want to know. I think it's a more than incremental to know if there's any kind of correlation between how people practice and how they perform on game day. I don't think it's an incremental thing. I think that's hugely insightful. But how, how do you know unless you observe it? So you That's know, what I wanted. And should, we, should we measure Wade Boggs' batting performance on days he didn't eat chicken? You know, those types of things, <laughs> right? So I don't to know. To him, it was meaningful. And <laughs> maybe it had some, Gee, I talked about psychographics. Gosh, so. maybe, maybe diet is irrelevant to sports performance. Maybe. Maybe not. So you don't know. So you don't know what the incremental value is. That's what I'm saying. No, I, we're so in the cost now we're okay, in violent we're agreement because, okay. because I, think, I think we're short shrifting it by saying incremental. I think, that's a, I think that's a flawed framing of the issue because we literally don't know. For, for certain athletes in certain sports, uh, uh, practice and diet yep. or, or steroids can make an enormous performance And it difference. may mean nothing. And it may mean nothing. And it may mean nothing. And, but you also have to take account of the fact that um, there's got to be a physicist in the room that what, what is the... By They're laughing at us. By here. observing something, you also change it. Yeah. I know there's a theory the Heisenberg, of physics. Heisenberg. The, the Heisenberg principle, yeah. exactly. The and mm -hmm. I think there's a Heisenberg principle as well that applies probably, again, not to all athletes. Do They're, you believe that? that the Heisenberg principle? That 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 as you monitor something, people's behavior changes as a function of how, how it's monitored. Have you observed that running trials? The only question is, do they know about it? If okay. they know that they're being observed, then they behave differently. If they don't know, then they don't. OK. It would be interesting to test what the effect of the monitoring is. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, it's well known, the Hawthorne effect, right? That's the Hawthorne effect, yeah. too. Yeah. That's <laughs> Hawthorne, has, there must be some other thing beginning with H it needs to be, involved so, here. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, like, you know, that's the, if you study people working in a factory, the factory all of a sudden produces more. It becomes more, more productive. Yeah, there that was go. the AT&T Western Electric experiment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But. I, I mean, my argument is that, yes, you could, I mean, if I put a patch on every player and measured, uh, you know, like 100 biomarkers on them, uh, and if I put an audio mic on them and I measured, like, every, every word which was spoken to them, I mean, that is raw data that I could use to build a model of uh, predicting their performance. But Claudia's point is, like, what would you change? Right. How would you then use that data to make the, the player better? Right. And so you need someone, whether it's a coach or the player, who's involved in the training of that player to make them better. Uh, and I, I, I don't know that, you know, I think the, the current methods for improving one's uh, capabilities on the field, uh, the, the room for improvement that we have on those methods is probably much smaller than the room for improvement that we have on the methods for drawing fans to the stadium or sure. selling more merchandise. So my argument is, and I also think there's, it's a lot, uh, most of the transactions which are occurring in terms of selling tickets franchise. and selling merchandise Go public are, yeah, so those, those transactions are happening in the digital domain in which they're uh, trivial to capture. So instrumenting these players and things is, I mean, you're, you're bringing up all sorts of issues about, uh, you know, wanting to measure them is, you know, on, on the one hand, they're your employees, 
Um, but you know, so if I wanted to put a patch on every programmer at Cloudera, that's a different thing than putting every a patch on every uh, sports player, right? So you're starting to get into sort of creepy Gattaca style uh, measurements. So that's when you ask me what I'm going to do. Creepy Gattaca style? I'm not asking you to do a <laughs> DNA sequence on them, at least not yet. You know. <laughs> no, for example, I'd love to be able to track patients when they leave the hospital, but who would want to be tracked by me? Not, yeah. I don't even want to track me. Yeah. <laughs> How many people in the room are self-quantifiers who track themselves? God, much, much smaller than I would have. I have a Fitbit. So. Yeah, yeah, much smaller yeah. than I would have. Do you mind I if I track you? Yeah. Sorry? You might mind if I track you. Um, if you can get, it, if I get a, see, a clear benefit to being tracked, we can, we can talk about that. You trust that. me. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> but, but I want to turn to questions from, from the audience, because one of, one of the points that, 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 that Jeff raised, I think, is addressed here, the, and, and also that, that Claudia. The analytics session, sessions focused on accurate data, how do you speak to the challenges of accurately collecting? Good Lord, this just flays out here. How do you uh, uh, speak to the challenges of accurately collecting large amounts of data? What, 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 are, what have you been finding in terms of data quality issues? I would imagine that's a really tough issue for you in, in, in healthcare, and probably less of a difficult issue for you, and probably one of the greatest sources of revenue for you in terms of getting people to clean up their, their, their data. What, what, what's the, the, the issue in terms of clean data? So we're collecting what amounts to HTTP requests between two computers. So there is not that much room right. for error. What happens regularly that is the data doesn't mean what you think it does. Sometimes our programmers make a mistake and they start recording something instead of decimal in, I don't know, base 36. And um, then things fall apart. But um, my biggest observation has been when people go to websites, I assume they are, they are out of their own free will, right? <laughs> that used to be true until about a year ago. And now about you know 36% of the web traffic we observe is what I would gently describe as non-voluntary. Um, I'm not sure I call it outright fraudulent, but something is up, and I can't believe that the people really do what they seem to be doing. So it's not that something's wrong with the data. The data still just measures one computer calling information from a different one. My interpretation of what it means has, I mean, I've, I've learned to look at it slightly differently and understand that it's just something different. It's just two computers talking. It's not the person making decisions, necessarily. So the, the influence of spam bots or other kinds of things. Yeah. OK. Chris, what's your, what? Well, and um, you know, we, we actually work with Jeff's firm a lot, too, and uh, hopefully he'll nod to this. You know, I think one of, the, one of the biggest falsehoods that we see when we talk to people about data, or maybe the, a misunderstanding, and I don't know if you'd agree with this. Hopefully you would. Um, is that companies feel like, or people feel like, if the data is not clean, I shouldn't try to collect it or analyze or use it. It has to be clean first. And you know, there's so much of it being created. And we talked about all those Vs and the variety these days. It's not true. You got to collect it. You've got to use it. You've got to transform it, and you've got to structure it. So there is a lot of work to be done. And that's part of so why. So you think it's our, used as an excuse, not a reason? Well, it's a valid excuse in some respects because you know computers are binary by nature, right? And if the data is bad, then the answers you get will not be precise and may not be correct. But that's not a reason to not move forward. That's what I'm trying to say. So I don't know if you, uh, although given all the stuff that we do together, I don't know if you feel the same way. But Jeff. Do you, do you find do you find that that the issue of clean you know as people collect more and more raw data at a certain level of scale or trying to apply it do they increasingly question whether that rawness is tainted in some sort of way is that the, is that an inherent issue of dealing with the the, the via volume hmm. yeah I mean I think it's uh, it becomes difficult to recognize when you do have an error. Um, because you just have to, you can't just eyeball the data. You have to rely on more automated uh, means of identi identifying data quality uh, issues. Uh, and it also, data cleanliness is dependent upon the use case. So depending on what you're trying to do with the data, uh, you know, you can sometimes use uh, approximation methods. Do you think do you think companies are sophisticated in regards to defining use cases for quote unquote big data and analytics? No. 
Absolutely. I mean, so yeah, you know, another another competitive, another uh, another thing that I was competing with my you know physicist versus social science distinction for most of the misunderstood aspect of big data is I think the level of sophistication of your competitors is massively misunderstood. Like there's this uh, everywhere I go, everyone thinks that their competitors are like incredibly sophisticated, and everywhere I go, they're very very unsophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just like you know like someone's doing something with data, but it's no one. You know like so I, I'm really yeah. The thing that's been most remarkable about starting Cloudera and having the opportunity to talk to like you know everyone who does stuff with data uh, is that wow like the, the the general level of what we're doing with data is very very low. I mean most places. So I was in a meeting at a very large bank in which you know there was the analytics vendor talking with them about this you know brand new modeling technique that we have coming out and you're going to be so excited to try it and they're just like yeah 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 that's great but what we're having a really hard time doing is getting all of our data into one place so that we can do modeling on it. Uh, and so I think that you know instrumentation and measurement um, and data preparation are really the core problems to be solved in this space. And you know in the sports domain, there's always we always had the data to do the analysis. It's just we didn't take the time to turn our observations into structured data uh, to actually observe things. So with all the scouts that we had deployed everywhere, you know they were giving grades. I mean you know you're oh, you're you know uh, 50 for your curveball and you're 70 for your uh, fastball and things like that. Um, so we were collecting some structured data, but now that we have pitch FX and we're recording things all the time, we can record much more uh, granular data. But there's this process of you can record the raw data on video and then do nothing with it, right. and you didn't learn anything. But right, then there's right. this process of extracting the structure from the raw data that was recorded. And so a lot of what's being done is not the modeling phase. So when I started my career, I started on Wall Street, and I was a, I, you know, I was a quant. So my job was in the modeling phase. And I looked at it, and I said, like, gosh, you know, the value that I'm delivering to this firm is minuscule compared to all the value that's being delivered between data generation and when it gets to me. Like, I knew that I had to go further up the chain, and all of the enrichment, the coding, the uh, outlier detection, and the uh, missing value uh, imputation. Like, there's just so much that happens prior to the modeling phase, which is where most of the value is actually being delivered. I would, I would say, that, Claudia, that in one of our conversations, you would agree with this. What do you think this audience and what do you think any user of raw slash big data needs to understand about gr what granularity means now and what it can and should mean as technologies, instrumentation, processing power improves, what it should mean. So what it means now, I think we are right now getting to the point, I would say over the last five years, it's easily a factor of 10 to 100 on the granularity on average. Wow. Um, I used to work for IBM, and we get these aggregate quarterly data sets on transactions, and the part of the problem is talking of cleanliness. When you look at that aggregated data, you lost any ability to diagnose what the hell happened to it. I added it all up, and it turned up to be three times the revenue we reported to Wall Street. So I was pretty sure something was wrong, but <laughs> I had no idea what or where even to start going. And once you get to the point that you actually give me access, and that brings, like to your point, going back up the value chain, yeah. I love to be part almost from the beginning of the recording, or at least be very involved and cognizant of what happened there. Once you give me access to the full granularity, because we have the tools, we have the ability to access it in reasonable time, like anything below a week. Um, so I can actually look at this as well. I know exactly what happened here. This particular source, like this instrument, went dark for three hours. It's not that over the day there was 10% less volume. It's the thing just basically blanked on me for three hours. Wow. And that's the information that makes me build much better models and make better decisions on what to do with data. So I don't want anybody to clean up my data for me. I want to be part of the process. You know, as, when you're downstream and you're modeling, you, almost everything that you find that's interesting is an artifact of an error in the instrumentation yeah. and measurement process. <laughs> it drives you crazy, and that's why I wanted to move upstream, because you're just like, you finally, your models finally turn up something useful, then you go, you trace it all the way back, and it's like, oh yeah. We Have you found that to be the case in healthcare? Well. <clears throat> There are big blind Which spots in healthcare. Which is famous for its filthy data. Right, so claims data, is a, claims is, claims data can be a, a bear to work with. And you know there are a lot of negative things because they're trying to reconcile accounts and so on. So you definitely have to take your time. And uh, I'd that's, rather be the guy that's doing it too. But That's such a polite answer. Well, going back to the cost benefits, because that's the economist of me, like, the cost of storing the data is getting smaller, but we still need to hire 
data scientists <laughs> to uh, analyze and it. So that's and where just we're getting. And they're just too expensive. They're they're. Um, that's the that's where the decision is. Like, <coughs> we're going to have a really smart person start from the beginning. Well, we're going to have to pay that person. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think also it depends what you're talking about, right? Because what I was trying to sort of assert earlier was get started, and there is absolutely a trial and error process. And as Jeff just said, you learn many times more from the errors. Now, certain like if you're dealing with prenatal care, for instance, you really, really, really don't want to make an error. And I think most GMs don't want to lose a game either, but the, the relative cost there, you know, and what I might learn from losing in some cases might be worth more than, um, you know, what I would, uh, what I potentially would gain from waiting until all the data is perfect before I can get started. Well, I, I want to build, build on that. And yeah. Claude, you mentioned IBM. I'm, I'm just going to throw out a, a horrible metaphor, but, it, but it's, maybe it's potentially catchy and maybe you'll roll your eyes, but why not a Watson for a pro sports team? You know, you have these huge data, you, you, you have these teams literally break down probabilistic analysis and rules for all these fields of knowledge up to and including puns. You could do the physical world counterpart with athletic performance or, you know, team on team, game situations, use cases, et cetera. Does the same kind of machine learning and, and data capture and high-speed processing that worked for Deep Blue and then for a Watson, how well would that map for football, basketball, baseball? With in-depth, with, with instead of a subject matter being what you decomposed, players decomposing or ensemble of players decomposing. And, and instead of, you know, competing <coughs> you know, Ken Jennings versus things, this team's model versus that team's model under these scenarios. Is that a ridiculous scenario, or is that the kind of thing you're, you're laughing already? Okay, sorry. The one thing you, you need to understand about Watson and uh, Deep Blue, and uh, they are very specialized architectures from the hardware right. through the algorithms over the data sources, and Watson was awful. When they started this two years before they finally won, they had about 10% of the performance of an average human Jeopardy player. Wow. And there was for a long time the question, can we push that? I mean, I think it's a great example of, if you really put your mind to it, how far you can push it. But don't be mistaken, this is a very special purpose architecture that is useful for one thing, answering pun intended questions um, <laughs> of natural language. And IBM has been spending the last three years or trying to repurpose it. Um, for healthcare. For healthcare, where you can interact with just the textual part. We're not talking of EEG data or, or um, fMRIs or anything else. So it's not nearly as universal a solution to all your world's problems as, as you may think it is. I think there's a lot of very structural thinking of like what exactly is the problem, what's the data, how do we put it together, that went into that degree of performance. Do you think a sports team or a sports league or a, a wealthy owner, you know, in the same way that a, that a John Henry brought mm -hmm. a Moneyball, you know, for, let's call it a, a Moneyball 1.0 to, to an analytics in sports or Billy Bean in, 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 in um, Oakland, do we see that, will we see the Watsonification of sports performance? The biggest problem, and I think we talked about uh, that Joe's comment was, um, you cannot afford to buy the skill set. You cannot buy the 20 uh, IBM um, scientists, well, you can, well, hey, you can. The point is, I can't prove to, I can't promise to you that it will make you any money. The biggest issue with data projects is, we all feel that it probably will work, and often it does. I'm spending but 20 million for a basketball player. I can't spend 20 million for a data scientist. You can't figure out who to hire because you don't know what you're looking for. With a basketball <laughs> player, you have the, I mean, you can have 15 different metrics on how good he is at what he's supposed to be. You couldn't tell a data scientist if you run into one. Maybe you could, but. No, not me, <laughs> not me. Do you agree with that, Jeff? Uh, which aspect of that do I agree? <laughs> Sorry. If, if an, a sports owner came to you and said, I'd like you to hire five data scientists, I, I want to I do the full Watson. 
Yeah, yeah. Before Watson. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I, I, I just heard that Claudia was wrong about one thing. Watson is not just good at text mining, it's also really good at marketing uh, <laughs> for, for IBM. So yeah, I mean, I'm frequently, and I actually, I have a second job, which is I work at Mount Sinai uh, School of Medicine, so oh. I, I work with healthcare data, and uh, I frequently get asked this question, so, uh, you know, the, the, the chief innovations in Watson were algorithmic, they were in how to go from natural language to a query, and how to create structured knowledge bases out of unstructured right. text. Right. Um, neither of which I think are going to be particularly useful to, in the sports domain. I don't think there are a lot of places in which you really want to turn unstructured, you really want to turn natural language into a query, or you really want to turn unstructured text into a knowledge base. I don't think either of those things are particularly uh, useful to people in sports. However, if someone did came, come to me and said, Just hey, a I second, if I did situational analysis of uh, game, uh, 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 football teams, Formations versus formations with certain kinds it's of talent. Totally unrelated to what Watson does. <laughs> you, I mean, you, you I agree that that could be you useful. Don't you don't think that maps? You don't think that kind Not of... Not at all. Okay. <clears throat> you, don't, you don't think the unit of analysis of a rule or stochastic probabilities associated, you don't think that kind of thing maps? They're just two different, totally different problems. Okay. I mean, Watson is all about, you know, extracting structured information from unstructured text. And there's not, there's not a lot of unstructured text floating around in sports that I really want to, I mean, if you wanted to figure out So the, what, you're, what, what Joe says then is pointless to instrument, it's pointless to instrument no, you the can, doctors you can certainly because, instrument, because it's unstructured interaction. So how, you know, how can you draw a meaningful interaction? No, those would be, I think we're just having a, a, a debate about uh, data formats rather than <laughs> uh, what they're doing. So let's, uh, to address your question okay. about if I, if a sports, uh, if somebody who ran a sports team came to me and said, I want to hire five of the most exceptional data scientists in the world, uh, you know, I, I certainly think it could be done, but then I would question sort of, you know, okay, how are you going to apply them? Where is the, uh, what's, where is the way in which you can improve your, what's your comparative advantage once you have five right. data scientists in your right. team? Right. What's the thing you can do better than any other, any other sports right. team in the world now that you have these five people? And I question whether it's like performance analysis or game strategy, just because the going and working on, okay, now that I've learned things about performance analysis, can we change our, the habits of our players? Or now that I've learned something about game strategy, can I change the habits of my coach? Uh, that, that seems much more difficult than learning things about how our organization operates, how we sell things, and changing the habits of my marketing department or my sales team. Well, two, two things. First of all, that question shifted from should I, you know, by the tool, Watson, as opposed to the, the carpenter who knows how to use the hammer, right? right? Which is the data scientist. So second of all, I'd say find one to start, really good one. Because first of all, if you hire five, they're gonna spend all day debating with each other over all these things that What's we're talking about that? up on stage. That's so, the fun part. That, that is the fun part. <laughs> but, you know, I think to have kind of a lead, but, but again, you've always gotta be testing, built out. Anyway, that's, yeah, I, I, you know, I, uh, you're trying to get to a result here. And obviously, in probably this market, it's true in all markets. I mean, results quickly. You know, I actually, I spent a lot of time in the world of soccer. I actually, I have some experience. I ran one of the biggest youth soccer tournaments in the country for like four years. And I know like the average tenure of a soccer coach is like a year. Right. And you know, it's, it, there's a very, very, very fast measure on how quickly we need to produce results here. So, you know, so start with a hypothesis, start with, it's really still people. I mean, Billy Bean, to me, I don't know if anybody agree with this or not, Billy Bean is a great data scientist. I don't think he realized he was a data scientist. I think maybe, you know, maybe Paul D. Podesta was the data scientist in that particular case, but that's really what you need. And if you go in and bring, you bring five Billies, they're just gonna fight with each other all day. Well, I, I, I think I, you have better result having one. I actually, okay, well I actually find that, that, that intriguing that you believe that the human factors aspect totally overwhelmed the, 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 uh, the collective intelligence to quote a, a, a Tom Malone uh, uh, phrase on, on this. I, I'm, I, I'm surprised by your pushback on different data formats on this, because my, my fear, in, in, as I listen to this, my worst fear <laughs> as this panel began is being realized, which is what you're, you seem to be saying is that, yeah, big data slash raw data really is money ball on steroids. But what is money ball on steroids? I mean, if it's, we're gonna get better answers, that's what we wanna get better answers, so. Because my hype, my operate, and I think one of the reasons why we did a panel like, like this, and you know, admittedly it was called big data, and admittedly there's a hype aspect to that, is that there really is a qualitative difference and a quantitative difference when you really have more raw material and, and a greater vocabulary of verbs that you are processing to gain insight into team performance, individual performance, franchise performance, 
or hospital performance, doctor performance, uh, 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 patient outcomes. I think it changes what you can measure, and when you change what you measure, you can change what you measure on inputs and outputs, and that can get better answers. And the, yeah, but but I, I, I sort of. But I think there's a difference. But you know, when we, we, this is why I wanted to focus on this issue of granularity. Granularity is a is a is a big deal. If 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 I have the tapes of everybody's the raw tapes of all these practices and all these games, you know, right? You know, obviously we, we've had these tapes for years, but now our ability to digitize them, run algorithms over that, interrogate them, bring different kinds of hypotheses. We can do, as you yourself pointed out, you know, it's, it's completely different now than five or, six, five or six years ago. I think that's transformative. <clears throat> but obviously, you, you guys disagree with me, and you're the, you're the data scientist, and I'm, I'm not. I think it's more transformative. You do need the measurements on the kind of what you're looking at, but if I understood what happened with Moneyball, that's not the way I would have looked at the problem. That's just a very different perspective. It was, yes, data to measure things, and it sounded to me as if a smart person figured out that they were just looking at the wrong measures for a long time. <coughs> that was all that really had happened. Right. So it's just instead of looking there, look here. That's not a fundamental shift in anything. It's just that somebody was an outsider enough to question the common myth that this is the way to look at the problem. This is not what we're talking about when we look at big data and, instrument, and instrumenting sports to make better decisions. I think I care much more on the end, what do we measure to know whether we made a better decision? And that I don't want to go with common myth or some other version of the same thing, but I want to get to the point where we can truly measure what matters. And I'm not sure I know what this is in sports. That's maybe part why I like the raw data, because then I can later on figure out in the conversation with somebody who actually knows what's going on, what I should be looking at. Maybe that's kind of where my drive towards the original comes from. Well, I think in many cases you don't know what matters. And that's exactly where the experimentation and going back to what we were talking about earlier, Collect everything. I mean, collect it, analyze it as much as you possibly how many, can. How many of your clients have bought in to the notion, collect everything? That's, Even if you don't know what to do with it, collect everything. The ones who are really using us well, um, just about all of them. And they collect as much as they possibly can. They throw away as little as possible. And then they look at what's meaningful. And they, they have hypotheses. They have intuition about what's meaningful. But they adapt as they work through the data. And it's, that, that's really what it's all about. Because, you know, when I said Billy Bean was a data scientist, I mean, Billy Bean, I don't even know how much, you know, I both read the book and saw the movie. I don't remember that he was really, a, you know, a guy who used computers heavily, but he had that intuition. Right. Tony La Russa. So, the, the Tony La Russa. Tony La Russa, right. He's the, so, you know, and Tony La Russa and Billy Bean are two very different types of personalities. Obviously, both been extremely successful. Intuition plays a role. Do hospitals collect everything? Well. Do they collect everything? No, they don't collect everything. Should they? Well, that, this gets you... back to can you change the behavior of, of players or coaches? Can you change the behavior of doctors? Tell a surgeon that the evidence says you should do it this way. They're going to just pop, you know, pop you in the face. I mean, they're not going to care what the evidence says. They're going to say, I know what to do with for my patients. And this is where it gets really interesting, when you can use a Watson-style answer for uh, really sophisticated people, like uh, from coaches to, to surgeons. I thought there was a really, I was just reading about uh, Kevin Euclid, and I'm sure probably people in this room, given where he was and where he went, are probably pretty happy about this. But, you know, Kevin Euclid had like the worst batting stance in Major League Baseball. And there was all this analysis and all these suggestions, and it sounds like they've screwed him up now. You know, and based on all <laughs> evidence of what is a good batting stance and not a good batting stance, you know, they moved him from a horrible batting stance to a good batting stance, but his average has gone off, you know, gone off a cliff. So there's obviously other variables in the case sure. of Kevin, and maybe very well up here. So, but this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Before, you don't know. Before I go to another question that we had here, I, I do want to ask a question of, of, of the audience. We, we had a number of hands go up with sports teams on this. A number of hands didn't go up in terms of instrumenting people during practice. But in terms of collecting everything, how many of the sports teams here, basically, even though you don't know what you're doing, you're, you're doing a good job of archiving and collecting everything for the future? Smattering of hands. I hope that you are the ones who come up <laughs> afterwards to, to talk on with us. Um, one of the questions that, that came from the audience is, how do you, and this, I'll start with you on this one, Chris, sure. how do you manage the struggle to present, quote, 
big data in a relevant way to the client. Is that, is that the big data, raw data analytics counterpart? To the, real, the real key is to present meaning. And that's hard to do right off the bat. That usually starts with a hypothesis. Visualization helps a tremendous amount, yes. Absolutely, you know, when they say a picture, you know, picture's a thousand words, I don't know how many bits of data it is, but visualization helps tremendously. And presenting, and it usually starts with a nugget of meaning, or in some cases, you know, something you find by, I, I thought Jeff's point was really powerful about making an error, what you find from an error, and the, the pivots you make on that. So that's where you start, so. Jeff? I find experiments are easy to communicate. So uh, longitudinal studies or observational studies, when you're, you're sort of digging through the data and trying to, to find results when you weren't actually able to control the intervention, uh, it seemed, like, it seemed to, they, they take more work and it seemed to be harder to communicate to some of our executives um, what we found. But when we ran an experiment and we could say like, here's the two things that we, uh, here's the two things that we tried, here's the outcome measure that we looked at and uh, we were able to show like that it was a statistically significant difference. Uh, regardless of my opinions about the, the notion of statistical significance. And so I felt that, um, I felt that if you're performing an experiment, uh, it's often, that's, that's the cleanest way, I think, to communicate results to non-technical people. Claudia? I mean, we are not trying to convince you to do anything with big data. We're trying to convince you to believe that we are doing good stuff with big data. That's an easier thing to sell because I can basically give you a trial run, look, try it out for, two months and see how much better it perf uh, performs to whoever else you hire to run your advertising uh, campaigns. So I'm in, I have the easier job of just let the results speak for itself. When I get in trouble is when they come back and say, great, but why does it work? And say, well, it's big um, in the sense that we build models that I'm not sure I understand on the level they like to have them communicated. So I think it's that's where we back to visualization where it becomes difficult to explain the why behind. It's easier once the performance is there. I mean, yes. let's all be clear on that. So it's a really, really, really smart black box. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, one of my specialties is trying to get these situations where <clears throat> we can believe that the variation in the treatment that you're interested in is not related to the, to the patients, for example. And so it's... And it's like an experiment would be a very similar case to that, where you were able to randomize one to another. That you can you can convince a doctor about that. So, um, in any kind of business, sports business or other business, if you can run these experiments, I think that that's one way that you can everybody sort of on the same page. That's going to get you an answer. In terms of getting to the why, I do believe that's a very important piece of it because if the environment changes, you're not going to understand why the previous correlations aren't aren't working anymore. And so that's why it's always good to keep digging on on the why. Well, I just want to say that this was, this was, I found the conversation fascinating, especially the parts where you vociferously disagreed with every proposition I made. <laughs> and I just want to thank the openness and, and the directness of, of the panel and for the questions and participations here. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be around for any follow-up or questions that you all have. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.